So I want to welcome you to Life Tree. Thanks so much for being here. It's the summer of Psalms. The summer of Psalms, but we're putting P's in front of it because there's a P in front of Psalms. It doesn't make sense. I still haven't figured that out yet, why they call it Psalms. I probably should figure that out. Like why they actually, why there's a, I don't know, silent letters. Aren't they like, aren't they dirty? Like when you're doing like grammar in school, like, you know, those silent letters, man, they're, they just kill her. Kids don't have to worry about that these days, though. Do you know this, right? Because they don't do grammar in school. I just tell the kids to do spell check. They don't even teach grammar. They don't do spelling at all. How many of you had to do spelling tests when you were a kid? Right? Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not Vic. He was too young. He was a kid when he, he, he didn't have grammar back then. But they don't teach grammar in schools anymore. Serious. It's ridiculous. Anyway, I digress. So we're exploring the Psalms and... Uh, taking a look at what they mean and how they might help us today, because uh, the Psalms, if you remember, these are songs. They're songs and poems written by musicians and, and singers and things like that, and they're not necessarily meant to be understood literally. So many times we can read through the Psalms, and it sounds poetic and cool, but like it's kind of some weird stuff, like, God, would you shatter their teeth? And, you know, God, would you smite them and, you know, send rocks you know, rain rocks down on their family. Like, oh, that's delightful. You know, or there's just sort of some language. So how do we, it's expressions of joy, of sorrow, highs and lows. So when you take all these very emotional expressions, and if you, and if you write, you might write some poetry, you might write some songs. I know we've got a few poets in our, in our midst here. And uh, you write and you write these lyrics. And sometimes they're just emotions. And what you write today, you don't necessarily feel tomorrow. But it was true in that moment, so you get it out. And that's kind of what the Psalms are like. And so we have to read them like that. But they are valuable. It's not just somebody's emotional, you know, journal or diary. They are valuable in helping us understand how to have a relationship with God um, as we walk through perhaps various seasons of life. Because not every season of life is high or low. You know, sometimes we get all sorts of stuff going on. So as we read through the Psalms, they help us know how to express ourselves and how to find God. And we can find truth in the Psalm as long as we take them right, and, and validate them or filter them through texts throughout other parts of Scripture, right? So if they're, we don't just read it, if it says it's other places, then we can say, okay, this is what it says about God. Well, it says, it says that here and there and there, and then we go, okay, so then it must be true, too. We can take that as truth and then apply it. So you'll see. It's how, it's how we, we, uh, we understand, and the word is exegete Scripture. How many of you get some hermeneutics? These are really good theological terms. If you go to Bible college, you get to learn these funny words. Nobody ever cares. All right, so anyway, Psalm 18. We're looking at Psalm 18 today. In your programs, you should have gotten bookmarks. And uh, in there, I would encourage you, we forgot to mention this last week, we have a whole summer of Psalms reading plan for you that each week you can read that Psalm, and you can read it once a week. I would really encourage you to read it once a day for that whole week because then it begins to kind of start to sink in a little different. You hear things differently when you read it day after day after day. So we've got a whole summer of just a reading plan for you if you'd like um, and would encourage you to do that. And it will line up with what we're sharing here at Lifetree. So that's just, that that gives you a map kind of where we're going for the summer. So I'm going to read just a portion of Psalm 18 to you. It's written again by King David. um, And I'm just going to read a little bit to you. Uh, Actually, next week we're going to talk more about a different part of Psalm 18, but just a little bit. Uh, Starting in verse 25, it'll be on the screen behind me. So I'm going to read it. Then I'm going to tell you the story behind it, and then I'm going to come back to it. Okay? Make sense? Good. And if not, we're doing it anyway. So here we go. Verse 18, chapter 18, verse 25 says this, To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To those with integrity, you show integrity. To the pure, you show yourself pure, but to the crooked, you show yourself shrewd. You rescue the humble, but you humiliate the proud. When the Lord, you light a lamp for me, the Lord my God lights up my darkness. Here we go. Lights up my darkness. So, um, it's an interesting psalm. It you know, sounds good. sounds nice and flowery, like a good little song. That's, that's positive. That's nice. Those are good feelings. I like that. You know, God, it's good. What's the story behind that? And some of the psalms have little headings, and they tell you the context of what that particular psalm was written about. And this one is another one of those that gives us that. And so this story um, is the story of King David, and it really has to begin with the story of King Saul, who was the predecessor to David. Saul was the one first, and don't worry, it's not a huge history lesson, but I've got to give you a little bit of background to make this make sense, okay? So when Saul was a boy, King Saul, right, he was just Saul, 
just a guy named Saul. Um, and he was a boy. Israel had no king. They had never had a king. They were just a, a people, you know, came out. Um, God led them through the, uh, you know, out of Egypt, right? All, they got their land. They're just a nation called Israel, right? And there's a people group, and they're there. They don't have a king. They're just sort of ruled by uh, prophets, people who speak for God. And they have some priests who kind of help with their, with their religious things, and that's it. There's no king. And they start looking around at the neighboring nations, and they're like, I want a king because kings lead us into war. And I want a king like the neighboring nations. And God says, hey, I'm your king. You don't need a king. And they're like, no, we want a king. And God says, listen, the king is going to tax you. He's going to take your sons and send them to war. He's going to take your land. He's going to take all of your, all that. He's going to put you to work. He's going to make some of you work for him just to, just to provide for his own kingdom. And they're like, oh, we don't care. We want a king anyway. Imagine arguing, arguing with God. Like, God, no, we know better. We need a king. So the people say that. And uh, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. So God says, okay, fine. You want a king? And says, Saul. Saul by now has grown up. He's like one of the tallest Israelites. And I have a problem with this. Just because somebody's tall doesn't make you qualified. You know, I don't know. But God says Saul was head and shoulders. Come on, all my short people problems, right? Saul was head and shoulders about ev above everybody else. And so they make him king. He doesn't feel worthy. He probably wasn't worthy. Doesn't want to be king. Says when it's time to crown him king, he's hiding. They didn't know where he was. They said he was behind some luggage. Like he's literally hiding. He doesn't want to be king. Um, but eventually he accepts it. He becomes king, and he was a good king for a little bit. Um, but then something happened. There's this moment in Saul's life as a king that happens, and it changed the trajectory of his entire um, reign. Okay? So um, they, have, they still have these prophets right, that are part of their nation, and one of them is Samuel. He's the one who anointed Saul king. And they're about to go into a battle, because king leads people into battle. They're about to go into a battle, and... Traditionally, what they would do before a battle is they would offer a sacrifice. We're going to offer a sacrifice before we go into battle. And so they're getting ready to go into battle. They're, Samuel says, hey, I will come. Sacrifice is the, the prophet's job, the priest's job. I will take care of that. Saul, you're king. You do your kingly things. I'll do the, the priest and prophet things, so you wait for me. So they're waiting to go into battle, and Samuel's taking his time. And Saul's getting impatient. And it says the soldiers are starting to get impatient. And Saul goes, you know what? I can't wait anymore. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I will offer the sacrifice. May not seem like a really big deal, but that's a pretty big deal back then. It's basically saying, God, all those laws you gave, everything I've ever been told, we're going to just throw all that away. I know better. And Saul offers the sacrifice, and then Samuel gets there, and it's a, it didn't go well. Samuel's like, what are you doing? And Saul's like, you're late. And he's like, yeah, and you ain't a prophet or a priest. It's not your job. And so in that moment, it was this, this deep, deep act of pride. In that moment, God says, okay, Saul, you don't have the kind of heart needed to lead my people. I'm going to pick somebody else to be king. And Samuel tells him, hey, listen, God has already chosen your successor. If you had followed God, you and your family would have been kings in this lineage. But because you blew it, God has already taken the kingdom from you and anointed someone else. And from that moment on, Saul became a very insecure leader. Like for the people that he's supposed to be leading and taking care of them, right? he's now suspicious of them and threatened by them. And God had chosen David to be king. And David didn't tell anybody. Nobody else knew this. And ironically, David and Saul's path cross. And David begins to serve Saul. And David knows he's supposed to be king, and he's not even trying to be king. He's just trying to be a good helper to Saul. It says he played music like Vic on the guitar, and he's making Saul feel better. Saul's like, yeah, that's good. That's good, yeah, because he, he would get anxious. And so, you know, he would get upset, and then music, David would play the harp, actually, so it's more like this. He'd play the harp, and then Saul would feel better. And so David would help, and then David was a soldier, and David would be Goliath for Saul, and David would go out and win battles because David was this incredible soldier, and David would do all this good stuff for Saul. Did nothing but good for Saul. And you know what Saul did in return? He was threatened by David. And so he kept trying to kill him. It says he threw a spear at David. And you know what David did? It said he ducked. And he kept playing his harp. <laughs> like, come on. Like, that's not normal. And Saul would continually do things. For years, he continued to try and he would just suspect that David would, was trying to get at him. And he wasn't. But Saul had already made decisions that led him down this really bad path. 
So now put yourself in David's shoes, right? He has to flee the country because the king just keeps wanting to kill him, and he can't live like that. He's going to get killed. So he has to leave the country. His, he, all he's done has been good. He's got to leave. Imagine in your head, you know, wait, that prophet said, I'm supposed to be the next king. I'm doing everything right. I'm, some, I'm trying to serve this king. And, and he's throwing spears at me. He's trying to kill me. I'm, I refuse. David actually has opportunities along the way to kill Saul. He's got multiple opportunities. Saul is sleeping just so happens in the cave that David's like hiding in. And David's men are like, it's your chance. It's your chance. Like, just end it. God's already made you king. Let's just end it. And, and David says, I refuse. He refuses. I tell you, it's so hard to do the right thing when others don't play fair. When they don't honor the code. It's like bad guys attacking the good guys when the good guys are trying to keep doing good for them. It's not right. It's painful. So David's got this, like Saul just continues to come after him. And then David has other enemies aside from Saul. Other enemies. Um, I'm, I'm not going to tell you about all of them. One of them, his name was Nabal. Um, he was a very rich man, beautiful family, lots of property. David's good to him, protects him, protects his sheep. Just as like David's this amazing fighter. Like David was like one of like probably the like most incredible fighters in history. And it's, he's just, so he was protecting people everywhere. So David's protecting Nabal, all his stuff. And then as Saul is chasing David and he's hiding, he comes up to Nabal and he says, hey, you know, would you, my, my, my men are hungry. Could you just, I mean, I know you got plenty. We, you know, could you help me out a little bit? And Nabal is like, hey, you know, how can I insult you more? He just starts to, like, curse David and says, you're a little, you're worth nothing. And he just, he says, who are you even? You're just a rebel. You're just a coward. I mean, he absolutely takes it out on David. Um, and David decides, I've had enough. Does he know who he's talking to? Like, I'm the one they sing the songs about. You know, David, like, I'm the, f so, so David's like, all right, Nabal, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill all of you. And David starts with his men. He's on his way. He's on his way. And Nabal, is, I don't know how this works out, but he had a wife named Abigail, and she was wise. So I don't know how they got together. Um, but she's really wise. And she rushes out to She hears what's happening, knows what's going on, rushes out to meet David, brings along all sorts of food and stuff, says, hey, here, take, please take this food. My husband, he's an idiot. So literally, she says, he's a fool. She said, everybody knows it. Nabal, the name in Hebrew means fool. She's like, he's named that. So please, please. She asked David to change his mind, and she says something in 1 Samuel that is, oh, man, it's always hit me. Oh, it's profound. She says this. She's talking to David, telling him not to come kill her husband. And, all this, and she says this, when the Lord has done all he has promised and has made you leader of Israel, she says, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Then your conscience won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. Oh. And when the Lord has done these great things for you, please remember me, your servant. And David says to her, praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you to meet me today. Thank God for your good sense. He says, bless you for keeping me from murder. And carrying out vengeance with my own hands. For I swear by the God of Israel who has kept me from hurting you that if you had not hurried out to meet me, not one of Nabal's men would still be alive tomorrow morning. Do you believe David? I believe David. I believe David would have like smushed them all. You'd never hear Nabal's name. But there's something here about her saying, oh man, like that just always stood out to me. Don't let this be a blemish on your record. How many of you wish there were people that had come to you at moments in your life with that kind of warning. Hey, you're going to regret this someday. You're better than this. Don't let this be a blemish on your record. You won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. So David takes the high road because of the wisdom from Abigail, and he doesn't do it. So now we come back to the psalm here. Now, the psalm here, it says this happened. This psalm was written. Okay, if you read the title, it says it was written at the time when David finally found victory over Saul and all his enemies. There came a day where David finally becomes king. Saul, 
David never kills Saul. Saul gets killed in battle. David gets given the kingdom. When David's enemies are now dealt with, and there's this moment where David sits down, and he goes, wow, God, you did it. You did it. You were faithful to put me on the throne. You spoke this maybe 15, 20 years ago, God. It didn't happen necessarily the way I thought it was going to happen, but God, you did it. And he's now passing on wisdom as he's writing this. That's the context for this psalm. He has now finally found peace from all his enemies, people like Nabal, people like Saul, all the people that are attacking him. And this is what David is passing on. It's wisdom he's gained through all his years, through years of watching people succeed even though they were rotten and immoral, even though they did wrong to him when he was trying to do what was right. Now he's on the other side of that. He's fought to do what's right the whole time. We know David's not perfect. We'll get to that in a moment. But he has fought to do what's right as best he can. He's on the other side, and he's offering wisdom back to future generations. We're going to read it again. So now read it with that kind of context and listen to it again. He says this, To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To those with integrity, you show integrity. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the crooked, you show yourself shrewd. You rescue the humble, but you humiliate the proud. You light a lamp for me, the Lord my God lights up my darkness. Here's the takeaways for us. For, for us, 2022, when you're trying to do what's right and nobody else seems to be, anybody live in a world like that? <laughs> Where maybe, maybe everybody else doesn't gotten the memo that they're supposed to live right and they're just cheating and cutting corners and taking the easy way out and serving self when it feels like bad guys are winning, when those who are doing what's wrong seemingly keep coming out on top, when someone has done something clearly hurtful or offensive to you and you just want to put them in their place, in those moments where you say, I've had enough, it's time for me just to take matters into my own hands, you can be Saul or you can be David. You get to pick. You get to be Saul or you get to be David. When you are tempted to take the easy way out, here's what David just wants you to hear. Ready? It's very simple. Three words. God sees you. God sees you. He sees you every time you choose to do right. Even when it would have been easier to do what was wrong. Even when it would have, no one would have noticed even when it feels like it wouldn't have made any difference. Nobody cares. It's not going to make a difference whether I go there. Nobody's ever going to know. I'm just going to do the sacrifice myself. I'm just going to smush this guy over here. I'm just going to indulge myself for a moment. It's a little thing. It doesn't matter. I just can't take it anymore. I'm just going to take matters into my own hands. I just want you to hear what David's saying to you. He is like Abigail coming to you, saying, don't let it be a blemish on your record. He's saying, God sees your faithfulness. God sees your integrity. He sees your purity. He sees your humility. Don't saddle your conscience with the staggering burden of regret. Fight for what is right. God sees you. He sees you. His Hebrew name is El Roy. It's the God who sees. This is not about perfection. It's not like, uh, you know, about doing everything right. If, If it was about doing everything right, we'd all be disqualified. We'd all be out. David's not perfect. He made lots of mistakes. You can read other Psalms where like David is like, God, you should kill me. I'm terrible. I'm awful. I've done so many things wrong. My bones feel like fire inside me because I've just done so much wrong. David acknowledged he was not perfect, but here's the thing. He kept fighting to do what was right. This isn't about perfection. It's about effort, about trying, about not giving up on that fight. When we do What we do when no one else is looking is always seen by God. And it's not meant to be a reason of fear like God's like, hey, I'm watching. Watching you, right? Because that can be like fear, like, okay, God's always looking. Oh, God's looking, God's looking. No, it's a reason to be encouraged. Because since God is looking, every time you do what's right, it counts. Because every time you do what's right, even if nobody else sees, he does. See, it counts, it's good. Even if no one else sees, God says, I see you. And not only do I see you, God says, I'm going to reward you. The question that comes is, okay, what's the reward? Tell me more. (laughs) 
What's the reward here? Are we talking moral victories? Character building, right? Oh, you can sleep better at night because you did what was right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, sometimes that's not enough. Like, it's good. Those are good reasons, but there's another reward that David reveals here in this psalm. He says this, the God who sees you wants you to see him. The God who sees you wants you to see him. Listen, he says this, to the faithful, you show yourself faithful. He reveals his faithfulness. When you're faithful, you get to see the faithful side of God. God does it. He takes action. He lets us see him too. When you have integrity, he shows you his integrity. When you are pure, God reveals his purity. When you're humble, God reveals himself as a rescuer. Last summer, our family had a pretty awesome summer. It was pretty good. We went to Costa Rica. It was one of the highlights. It was absolutely amazing. I, I took that picture on oh, my phone. That's not like, that's not Google. Like that was just, oh man. There was like in this tree up here, there was uh, all sorts of crazy birds and things going out. We saw, we saw, what did we see? Parrots in that tree. We saw caracaras in that tree. We saw all sorts of amazing, amazing, I mean this was just out of our minds. It was so cool. So much natural beauty. Um, on one day, we took a tour uh, through a national park there called Manuel Antonio. It's a, it's a national park right there in Costa Rica on the southwest coast. Um, and we, we hired a guide. And my dad was a little skeptical on the trip. He's like, I don't need a guide. I can see things just fine on my own. Um, what do we need a guide for? Like, I, can, I got binoculars. I can see stuff. And so we're like, all right, whatever. We hire a guide. And this, this guy's walking. Hey, come here, follow me. And we're like, yeah, okay. We can, yeah, whatever. We're going to go follow him. Um, and he just would, like, stop. And we're like, what is this stopping for? And he'd like walk over to a leaf and he'd turn it over and there'd be like something ridiculous on the leaf. And you're like, how did you, did, you did, how'd you know that was there? Like, and the first time you're like, okay, that was, you got lucky. And then he'd be like, okay, stop here. And we're like, he's like, here, look. And, he, and like, look through. I'm like, look, I'm like, there's nothing there. I'm looking through. I'm like, oh, oh, that's a sloth. Yeah, we didn't see that. How did we not see that? And he's pointing out all this stuff. Am I lying? We would have walked by all this stuff. Never would have seen it. Never would have known. Birds, frogs, bugs, you name it, sloths, all sorts of creatures. The point is this. There are aspects of God that we can't see on our own, that we walk by every single day. And Saul had a relationship with God, but he did not commit himself fully to God. And so he walked by all the good God wanted to give him. It was, it was there just as much as it was there for David, and Saul just walked by it. He missed out. It doesn't mean God loves you more because you're pure. It doesn't mean like you're more special or you're more God's favorite or anything like that. You're not more valuable. It simply means that there are parts of God that we can't see until we do what's right. There are just simply parts of his character that you can't find until you walk that road. You want to see the faithfulness of God, you've got to be faithful. You want to see the purity of God, you've got to be pure. You want to see his integrity, his quality. You want to see the rescuing of God. You've got to be humble. You've got to do those things. So again, we take to the Psalms and confirm what we sense they're telling us through other scriptures, right? Is this, I mean, it's just David saying these things. How do we know this is true? Go to Titus, New Testament. It says, everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure. But nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupted. It confirms that our purity is absolutely connected through our faith, through our vision. We can't see it. If we're not pure, everything else looks dirty. There are some people, not you, nobody in this room, who would be pessimistic. They're like a half-empty kind of people. Sky's always falling. How can you have those people in the same exact world as people who are joyful? Let me tell you, to the pure, all things are pure. To the joyful, right, you see the joy. To those who see God, you see that side of life. And it's not saying we ignore the other side of life. It's still there. It's just not leading. It's not the only thing we see. 
Jesus himself affirmed it in his famous Sermon on the Mount. He says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Purity connected to sight. God says, hey, I see you. He says, but I want you to see me too. I want to reveal my goodness to you. When God sees us doing right, we get to see him in all his righteousness, in all his goodness. And he's saying, listen, even when nobody else sees, when the world around you is telling you just take the shortcut, take the easy way out, take it in your own hands, just do it your way. God's saying, hey, listen, do it the right way. I see you. And not only do I see you, but you'll get to see me when you do that. There are qualities of God we can't discover until we do what's right. To the faithful, he shows himself faithful. To those with integrity, he shows integrity. To the pure, he shows himself pure. So how do we do that practically? What does that look like? Real world. Okay, so that's nice. Church little message. But like, we're going like, to walk out of the senior center. We didn't even get to play bingo. And like, like what, what next? Like, how are we going to practically live this out? What does it mean to like, be faithful? What does that actually mean? Being faithful means trusting even when you don't understand how or where or why or what or who. When you have no answers and you're like, God, when you sense God telling you to do something, particularly in moments perhaps that you go, I definitely wouldn't normally do that thing, but you're asking me to do this thing. Being faithful means being full of faith. God, I trust you. I trust you. A story is told of a night a house caught on fire and a young boy was stuck upstairs His father is shouting at the window to him from the ground, saying, jump, I'm going to catch you, bud, jump. And he knew the boy had to jump to save his life, and all the boy could see is smoke and flames and this stuff, and he says, Dad, I I can't see you. And his dad says back to him, it's okay, because I can see you. That's all that matters. See, faith is about trusting that God says he can see you, so, okay, God, I'm going to take this step. Wherever you ask me to go, God, I'm going to do it. If you will be faithful, so will he. He won't fail you. Caitlin couldn't sing a more appropriate song. We can't experience the fullness of faithfulness of God until we, <laughs> until we activate ours. So here's the question for you. Is God prompting you to do something in faith right now? Perhaps this past week you felt like God just sort of stirring you to do something and you're like, ah, I don't really want to do that. And you're kind of shoving it away. Maybe the past month you just feel like God's telling you to do something and you're like, ah, I don't want to do that. You want to see the faithfulness of God? Be obedient. Be faithful. Trust him. Jump. (laughs) Jump. What does it mean to be a person of integrity? On April 14th, 1912, a ship thought to be unsinkable, carrying over 2,000 people, hit an iceberg and sank, taking with it 1,500 lives. The reason the Titanic sank has been debated for many years. It could have been arrogance and it's tight in the part of the crew. It could have been shoddy workmanship, perhaps rivets and things like that, or screws that weren't you know, made well. It could have been dangerous conditions, but here's what we know for sure. It's what they couldn't see that sank them what they couldn't see. An iceberg, 90% of an iceberg is below the water line. That's just a biological fact. About 10% is what you can see. 90, so if you see, whatever you see of an iceberg above the water, 90% is going to be below the water. There's a, a teacher named Tim Elmore, and he uses a metaphor for that as our integrity. He says, your integrity is 10% above the water and 90% below the water. He said, most of your integrity people will never see. Says, but that's what sinks the ship. He states that we often spend about 90% of our time investing in the 10% people can see and rarely spend much time at all investing in the parts that nobody will ever see but the part that actually determines who we are. To be a person of integrity means being a person of truth, particularly in those parts that no one will ever see. My dad gave me a plaque. It's in my office. And I got a picture of it here, I think. Here we go. It's a quote by Clarence McCartney. It sits in my office and it says this, The better the man, the better the preacher. When he kneels beside the bed of the dying or when he mounts the pulpit stairs, every self-denial he has made, 
Every Christian forbearance he has shown, every resistance to sin and temptation will come back to strengthen him and to give conviction to his voice. Likewise, every evasion of duty, every indulgence of self, every compromise with evil, every unworthy thought, word, or deed will be at the head of the stairs to meet the minister on Sunday to take the light from his eyes, the power from his voice, and the joy from his heart. How would you like that in your office every week? Every time I preach, I I look at that. Because you have no idea what I do all week. I could get up here and just preach. Sounds good. But it would be absolutely nothing if inside I'm falling apart. That's what integrity means. It's up to me. Just like it's up to you to be a person that people hope that you will be. Now that people expect you to be or that people need you to be. Who has God called you to be? Are you being true to yourself? You being a person of integrity, everything you do matters. And so the question again is, is there anything... God perhaps is revealing to you right now inside you that he's going, this is not who you are. You're violating your integrity here, and you know it. Is God putting his finger on any part of your life? I want to encourage you, let God transform you into a person of integrity because if you will, you get to see God in all of his goodness and rightness. What does it mean to be a person of purity? We've talked about this often. Guard what goes in, right? Kids song, be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little um, hands what you do. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful. Feed yourself what's pure. Think about what's pure. Refuse to chase what isn't. Once served under a pastor that said, how do you stay pure in a world that's so dirty? How do you stay pure in a world that's so impure? Like every time you look anywhere, it's just garbage, garbage, garbage. How do you stay pure? And he goes this, you don't. He <laughs> said, you just wash often. Every day you get on your knees and say, okay, God, here's where I messed up. It's confession. God, I confess I blew it today. It's not perfection, but God, keep me right. It's never going so long that you say, God, I stopped asking for forgiveness. I don't care anymore. I'm just going to do what I want. Don't get to that point. That's how you stay pure. So is there something you need to repent of, to remove from your life? I can promise you it will be worth it. And finally, what does it mean to be humble? Someone once said humility is like holding God's hand. Like imagine a child in a store. I'd invite my son up, but he's bigger than me now. I admitted that first time. But when little children hold your hands in a store, they have no idea where they are. They just trust that you as a parent know and that you're not going to lead them wrong and they're going to follow you wherever you go in the store. They're going to walk with you holding God's hand, holding your hand. That's what it's like to be humble. It says, God, I trust you. I'm going to hold your hand. Wherever you go, I trust you. I don't know, but I trust that you do know. God, I don't see it all. It doesn't mean you know, elevating yourself. It doesn't mean demoralizing yourself. It just means seeing yourself clearly. God loves us all equally. All people, we're all equal. None of us are better. It doesn't matter if you're taller than me. You're not better than me. You hear that. You're not better than me just because you're taller than me. Um, Doesn't matter how old, how young. Doesn't matter what you look like, what you can do. We're all equal in God's eyes. Humility just says we're all equal in God's eyes and we all need God. That's humility. So is there some sort of pride in you? Are you thinking too little of yourself? Are you thinking too much of yourself? Is there something God prompting you to surrender, to let go of, to say, hey, you are not holding my hand here. If we will commit ourselves to living like that, we get to see God in brand new ways in all his fullness. In Costa Rica, there's a saying. It's everywhere. What is it, Ethan? Pura Vida. There you go. means the pure life. The good life. How you doing? Pura Vida. Right? Let's just say it. It's good. Life is good. Pura Vida. Right? It's just everywhere. It's an answer. It's how you talk about stuff. It's what you say. It means everything is as it should be. King David had a hard life, filled with all sorts of challenges and injustices, and yet he discovered that when he did what was right, he experienced God in brand new ways. Saul had that same opportunity, chose to take matters into his own hands, and you can see from that point in his life, it was a steady descent into losing his mind, into losing his spirit, into losing everything that he had. Because he refused to trust God, to, sh- to see that part of God. 
So I want to encourage you. You want that pure vida? You want that pure life? We get there by living the pure life. God will show himself to you as you live out faith, integrity, purity, and humility. I'm going to call the band back up, and we're just going to close with a, with a song. We're going to ask you to bow your heads. We're going to close in a word of prayer. I'm going to take a moment. I just want to invite you in this time, if perhaps in one of those key areas God has just been speaking to you, just take one. Maybe there's something about faithfulness that God has just been speaking to you about, about being obedient to him, trusting him, following him. Maybe there's something about your integrity that God is saying to you, that you're violating it somewhere. Maybe there's something about your purity and God's saying, hey, you need to wash your hands of this. You need to come to me and say, this doesn't belong in my life anymore. Or maybe, maybe it's about humility. Maybe you need to just stop trying to do it all in your own power. Say, God, I'm not strong enough. I'm not good enough on my own. I need you. So I just want to invite you right now, where you are, to allow God to do some business in your heart, to work on you, to correct some things, maybe in his own way just to tell you one thing that you need to do to respond today. Remember, he's good. He doesn't want to smush us. He's not here to punish us and say, how dare you? He says, hey, come to me. I love you. I want you to see me. I want you to see me. I just want to encourage you. God sees every time you are faced with a decision. Every time you choose to do the right thing, he'll reveal himself to you in a brand new way. Never wasted. Even if nobody else sees, it's never wasted. Heavenly Father, we just so grateful for who you are, that you're real. It's not just a, a moral code of how to live, God, but it's a relationship. God, you're real and you're talking to us and you're, 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 you're put, pointing out things in our lives that need to be corrected, Lord. You're encouraging things in us that we need to keep doing. You tell us to keep doing what's right. If you need strength today to keep doing what's right, I pray for you. I just want to invite you. Raise your hand. Just say, I just need strength to keep doing what's right. And I pray for you. Go ahead. Just raise your hand so I see you. God, you see our hands. Anybody else? God, I just want to keep doing what's right. God, you look and see our hands. Give us the strength we need, the courage we need, the faith we need to believe that it counts, that it matters. We're not here just to serve self. We don't just get brownie points for doing what's right. And Lord, we actually get to see you in brand new ways. Give us that strength that we need. If you're here, perhaps you've never had a relationship with God. You say, God, I've, no, I've never actually done any of that. Heard about it, thought about it, but never really considered it for myself. Maybe something about these scriptures stood out to you and you go, you know, I, I want to seek the goodness of God for myself. If that's you, I just want to invite you to raise your hand and say, God, I want to see you today in a brand new way. You just raise your hand if that's you today. See those hands. Anybody else? God, I just want to see you in brand new ways. God, you see our hands. Anybody else? For the first time, I just want to I want to start a relationship with you, God. I want to know you. I just want to follow a code, God. I want to know the one who made me, who loves me, and who wants me to see him. Jesus, you see our hands. Lord, pour out your goodness on us. Lord, your word tells us that there are parties going on in heaven every time somebody starts a new relationship with you because that's what you want, Lord. That's the whole point of this. 
not to get us to appease you or to do what's right so that you can just check us off, prove something, but God, you want to be in relationship with us more than anything. That's the whole point of life, is to know you, to walk through this life with you, to fully discover all that you have for us. I thank you, Lord, for each that have raised their hands, for those who are today have acknowledged they want to start a relationship with you. God, I just I thank you. We celebrate. You're so good. You're so good. Thank you for what you do, for continuing to reveal yourself to all of us. And God, encourage us as we go throughout this week to fight for what's right so that we can find that pure life, to live that way. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand, and we're going to close with a song. I invite you to sing along with us as we, as we close our service tonight. offer if God was speaking to you in any way and you'd like to talk about what next steps you need to take or where you go from here, please reach out to me. You can write on a connection card. 
just let me know and I'd be honored to meet with you at some point in this coming week and just talk about where do we go from here. So I want to thank you so much and let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the honor of gathering together, Lord, for the, the gift we have of each other. So good to know we're not alone in this life. Lord, we get to walk side by side with brothers and sisters. Lord, so many gifts that you've given us to encourage us, to lift us up. I pray that your blessings would be with us as we go. Lord, continue to reveal yourself to us as we go out throughout this week. Lord, and continue to let your spirit be the voice inside us, encouraging us to do what we know is right. Lord, it makes all the difference. It's in your good name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks so much for coming.